So, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for coming for this last presentation. And well, as Alex said, uh, I'm going to discuss about the, the role that political parties play within the structure of the electoral management bodies. Uh, I do this with a focus in, in, in Latin America. And uh, the question I ask is, as you can see here, is to include or not to include party representation in electoral institutions and confidence in elections. So as you can see, we have two different pictures here. I mean, and although I'm uh, focusing on Latin America, I think these are two good uh, mini cases to, to discuss. Uh, the first picture here you have uh, Nelson Mandela, and I use it because of the 1994 uh, elections in, in South Africa. Uh, for those elections, uh, Judge Kriegler, which was the head of the Electoral Commission back then, uh, and I'm going to quote him, he said that while South Africa's messy 1994 election was successful, Mexico's technically perfect presidential election ended in protest. The reason he said because of this, he said that while in South Africa, incompetent elections were accepted because people believed in it. And people believed in it because the EMBs had the support of the political parties. So these elections had like many technical flaws. Uh, the, the election commission only had a, about four months to, to prepare the elections. I don't know, maybe you remember the, the pictures from the longest queues you've, you've ever seen in history. Uh, there was a hacker that infl infiltrated the result system and it was like flagged out by, by IFIS. And uh, I mean, there were like many, many problems. But in spite of this, you know, it was a historical election and people believed in it because uh, the political parties supported the electoral management body and uh, they supported the commissioners. Um, even the, the head of the commission, uh, Judge Kriegler, in spite of being an Afrikaner, he was trusted by the political parties because he was always in contact with them and also you know, through his history, uh, his judgments as a judge were against the apartheid system. But uh, well, that's a, a different uh, thing. And uh, one of the main reasons uh, why this election worked is that the Independent Election Commission in South Africa uh, set up a party liaison committee to just discuss and consult and include political parties in, in every decision. And this committee actually is still working to, to date. And all political parties at the national and local level have, have a voice there. So they are involved in the decisions. On, on the other side of the slide, you have the Kenya 2007 election that, as you know, ended with uh, thousands of people dead, many more uh, displaced. And uh, one of the key reasons behind this is because political parties and people in general did not trust the, the election commission of, of Kenya. Uh, 19 out of the 22 election commissioners were uh, actually appointed just a very few weeks before the election and there was no uh, inter-party consultation. And most of them, these 19 out of 22, were basically appointed by uh, President Kibaki. So, you know, you have two different ways to look at it. And uh, I give you these examples just to say that it's in my opinion, it's important to include political parties in electoral management bodies because, you know, they're the main objects of regulation in elections. So, oh, this is what I just said. So I'm going to skip this uh, slide. Um, so, like, basically during the 1990s, there was, uh, like, many scholars and, and practitioners pointed at, you know, the importance or stressed the importance of having formerly independent electoral institutions. And this can be understood because, you know, you came, you had transition elections, you had the, the excitement about the third wave of democracy, which before many elections were run by the governments or by a ruling party that didn't allow uh, for competition, didn't allow other political parties to, uh, to attain power. So, you know, it's, it's easy to understand how the emphasis was put in independent commissions. Then, you know, things evolved, and more recently, the debate, that has been a little bit overcome, but the debate is whether to have uh, partisan autonomy in electoral management bodies or have party representation. And uh, there's actually no, no agreement with this. And there are two main models. The first one is the multi-party based EMBs, where uh, individuals, where the, the commissioners or uh, the top staff of the EMB is appointed by political parties. So in a way they act as political party agents or uh, representatives. And the other model, which is the expert based EMB or the ombudsman model, where you uh, appoint, where you nominate people that are really uh, well known in their field or they have like this reputation and they're selected because they have like um, a lot of technical experience uh, in the field of elections. So those are the two models. Uh, as I said, there's no consensus on which model is best. I mean, here I just, I just mentioned four of the, of the authors 
that address this topic, but at the end I added the bullet point with etc. because you have so many more. And uh, they assess the different models uh, and their impact either on election quality or election credibility, on post-election protests, on different types of manipulations, manipulation, and there is no agreement. And even those that find that, for example, independent EMBs are better, they also admit that in some cases, party representation can also be good for uh, having an acceptable election or can also um, support companies. That's, that's the case of Hartlin and, and, and colleagues. Uh, also, for example, Rosas for, for Latin America, he says that in countries with high levels of democracy, EMBs appointed by political parties may increase trust. But at the same time, of course, in countries with low levels of democracy, then autonomous EMBs are the ones that are recommended. So uh, there is no clear uh, position on which kind of EMBs are best. Uh, Sarah Birch, in her last book on uh, electoral mal malpractice, said that in general, multi-party EMBs have a negative effect on the quality of elections. But when she tested that for a specific type of electoral manipulation, which is the exclusion of political parties from the competition, then she says it's good to have party representation. And of course, it makes sense. They don't want to exclude themselves or their... You know. uh, finally, uh, Pipa, in the last book of uh, the trilogy, she uh, tests this and she said that formal organization of the structure of EMBs is not a significant predictor of levels of electoral integrity. And in this way, she just uh, takes you know, the whole debate and uh, the position of, for example, international idea, uh, many practitioners, Lopez Pintor, that emphasized that EMBs had to be independent. So Pipa has done it, also Sarah Birch has done it, and they have demonstrated that it's not necessarily the case. So, the question is, should political parties be included in the appointment process of the EMB? And if so, uh, to what extent? So, I mean, should they be politically independent? Or uh, should, you know, political parties be included? And how? Um, so, I mean, this is important because political parties are a key link between citizens and the political system. They can influence public opinion. And as I said, they are the main object of regulation of electoral management bodies and are at the center of its processes. So they basically can be affected by most of the things that EMB does. Uh, you know, boundary delimitation, party registration, they are regulated in their campaign activities, in their campaign financing, their incomes, their expenditures. So, you know, they are at the center. So uh, in my view, it's, it's only, not only fair, but it's necessary for them to be included because that makes it less likely for them to then challenge the elections. If they had like something to say when uh, the commissioners, for example, were discussing uh, how to draw the districts, and if one party is affected, and if they have a say, they might find a, you know, a way that makes everyone happy. Where, where, whereas if the political parties are not there, you know, so we'll more on that uh, later. Um, okay. So I do this, and I, I test this, like if EMB should be politically independent or not, and if so, how much should political parties be included? by using the Parliamentary Elites of Latin America survey by the University of Salamanca in Spain, which uh, asks, it's, a, it's an elite survey, asks congressmen and women from uh, different Latin American countries from 1995 or so to, to date. I take waves two to five. And uh, what I do to, to measure if political parties should be included and to what extent, so I propose a four-point scale of the level of participation of political parties in electoral management bodies. So first, you have electoral management bodies where political parties do not participate whatsoever in the appointment. That's the case of Brazil, for example, where the Tribunal Superior Electoral is uh, the members are appointed by the judiciary branch. Some of them are appointed by the Supreme Court and some of them are by another tribunal. And Ecuador, where actually you have a citizen participation council that appoints the members. Then you have EMBs where political parties have an indirect role in the appointment. So that's the case of Mexico, Guatemala, and many others where, like, for example, two-thirds majority in Congress decides to, uh, you know, appoint the members. So, you know, you, you, have, you normally have this appointment because many political parties participate, but indirectly. So then you have a partial direct participation, and it's the case where... EMBs, some of the members are party representatives and other members are selected by another method. 
So that's the case of Uruguay, for example. We have nine commissioners, nine members of the board. Four of them are political party representatives, political party agents, and the other five are selected by a two-thirds majority in parliament. So you have this, this mixture. And uh, finally, you have EMVs, where all the members are political party representatives. So that would be the, the, the perfect example of a multi-party EMB. So only political party agents are sitting there. So that would be Colombia nowadays, or Ecuador bef uh, before 2008, when Correa changed the constitution and many of the things in the country. I measure the impact on this in uh, the confidence in, in electoral processes, and I use that question that it's on the, on the survey. It's a one to five question that I actually, following Bert's study on, uh, on electoral manipulation, I ended up dichotomizing it. And uh, I have a number of controls. As you can see, I have corruption, uh, economic development, support for democracy, support for elections, and uh, other uh, usual suspects, you know, winners, winner effect, age, gender, ideology. Uh, trying to be fast because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so uh, at the end, I, I do uh, three models. The first one is uh, logistic regression, where I just test for EMBs where political parties participate or where political parties don't participate. So instead of using my four-point scale, I just customize that and I take, okay, where they don't participate, like the case of uh, Ecuador or Brazil, that's a zero. And when they do participate, which is basically the rest of the cases, that's a one. So I, taste, I test for that with logistic regression. Model two, I also do a logistic regression, but I use my four point uh, scale, the four levels of participation of political parties in EMB. And then I have a third model where I take into account uh, the structure of the data, because in this case, it's individuals who are nested in, in countries. Uh, and I run it with the four point scale. Uh, so the results are, are the following. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, just here, you know, you have the usual suspects. For the one I circled in, in red, for the first model, it is significant. So EMBs, where political parties participate, are more likely to create confidence in electoral processes. Then for the model two, I test the four different uh, categories, with the reference category being no participation from political parties. And I find that having an indirect participation, such as in Mexico, where two-thirds of the Congress appoints them, that is significant and positive. And also having a partial direct participation is significant and positive, like in uh, El Salvador and in Uruguay, where some of the members are political party members and the others are selected by the judiciary or other methods. However, full direct participation, so that's the full multi-party where all the members are agents, that was not significant. Then for the Model 3, uh, w when I did the, the multi-level with the help of Alex, who is a genius in those things, by the way, and uh, the one that, uh, the only one that came out significant was partial direct participation. Again, so like Uruguay and El Salvador, with some of the members are uh, political party agents and the others are, are not. So Interpreting this, you know, uh, what I would say, it's, it's good to include political parties in, in EMBs, but not all the way as to let them completely run the show. Uh, and, I mean, as I said before, it, it makes sense. They are the main stake stakeholder when, when running an election. They are at the core of many of the activities and decisions of electoral management bodies. They are affected by party registration, campaign finance, campaign media regulations, uh, vote results, vote counting procedures. So it makes sense that they are, they are included. Uh, however, one thing is to be included and have a voice, and the other thing is to run the show and have the full powers of voting. And uh, I didn't include it here, but there's like some of this literature that hasn't found you know, the answer to this. Some of these works actually say, uh, without testing it, they say that maybe having only political parties can lead to a lot of infighting and paralysis within the EMBs. And uh, so maybe, I mean, that's a thing to explore later on. But, you know, basically what I say here, yes, include them, but not all the way so they, so they run the show. Um, this is the other part of the model. It didn't fit <laughs> in one slide, and I'm not good with PowerPoint. So, uh, of course, you know, the others are... as. You know, and that's, that's not the main issue you have. You know, of course, the winner effect is always there. People on the, with a left-wing ideology are less likely to have confidence in, uh, 
electoral processes. But here I include a picture. That's the, the general council of Mexico's National Electoral Institute. And here what you have, these guys over there, are 11 commissioners select, selected from uh, their expertise by a two-thirds majority in, in Congress. And they are impartial figures. And they, can, they have a voice and they can vote. And here you have all the political party representatives sitting there. They do have a voice, they can challenge many things, but they, they, can, they don't vote. And this structure is actually replicated at many different levels of the institutions. So we have different commissions, commissions for training procedures, commissions for uh, electoral logistics, and you always have in those commissions, for example, three commissioners and all the political party representatives sitting there. So, you know, they are included, they are taken into account. That's positive. Even, for example, I mean, there are also other ways to include political parties. For example, Costa Rica doesn't include political parties in the appointment, but they, the Tribunal Electoral something, um, they organize uh, a monthly coffee session with political parties. So they informally discuss everything from uh, future electoral reforms to, I don't know, issues about dealing with the ink or the size of the ballot paper. And uh, political parties don't vote, but at least they can uh, tell what they, you know, they feel. So including them is good. I think it can act as a preventive medicine. And uh, as I say, you know, the, the, the findings of this paper point that, you know, it's good to include political parties and let them into your house, but not so far as to let them into the kitchen and make the, you know, the, the dinner. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to present this paper that I wrote in these this weeks, these few weeks, <laughs> few months here. Um, I will go quickly to the core of the presentation with uh, methodology and models. So. Before this, just a brief introduction about the theories about electoral accountability. It is generally studied through um, the approach of economic voting. For example, we just back in Stegmaier made a uh, literature review about this, this topic recently in 2007. Uh, but the first, the first works about this, this topic uh, are uh, those by he, Fiorina, and several others that, that concluded that uh, voters are rational, economic, and retrospective. However, um, moving the focus uh, towards um, Central and Eastern European, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, some scholars like Martin Paldam in uh, the beginning of the 90s realized that uh, this effect um, is not the same for um, all countries, but it varies a lot and it called it a stability paradox. So, um, more and more, um, more and more scholars um, uh, got interested in uh, study, studying the effects of other variables on uh, this economic effect. Uh, in, particularly, uh, in particular, uh, Powell and Witten, and following them, uh, Anderson, uh, at the beginning of the 2000, the, the, new, the new sector, let's say, <laughs> uh, study the effect of the political context with an approach called, quite well-known approach called uh, um, the clarity of responsibility approach, so studying the effects of the institutional uh, arrangements on uh, um, voting behavior in particular related with economic evaluations. So, but, uh, so this is the main approach through which Electoral accountability has been studied in, this, in these decades. But uh, there are something else, probably. We need something to study something else. And I was thinking about uh, the inclusion of, in, of a variable measuring electoral uh, um, quality, so the perceptions. How um, do uh, perception of electoral quality or electoral integrity influences um, voting behavior? In, uh, of course, in many cases in Central and Eastern Europe, because electoral malpractices uh, allow corrupt politicians to bypass these electoral uh, the accountability checks, and so risks to uh, risk to influence trust and legitimacy of public institutions and voting turnout. So that could be a serious problem for <laughs> the entire democratic system. So a uh, research qu question and uh, hypothesis. <laughs> Voters operate in uh, mm, 
this is Anderson in, uh, in this very interesting paper say that voters operate in uh, various uh, uh, social, political, and economic environments. So, uh, since we have these several environments in which voters operate, we have to, um, our research question will be, what are the dynamics, so not also economic variables or dynamics, that explain variation, the extent to which citizens uh, hold uh, politicians accountable at the elections? So understanding, uh, um, so the, que uh, the, the question we want to answer if um, we, um, voters need other conditions on the part, for example, the political context, or for example, um, they take into consideration the, the quality of, of election when they cast their vote um, and judge the, account the, the incumbent governments. So the hypothesis uh, will be the following. The, the first one is, uh, refers to the, the approach about systemic, uh, systemic variables. In particular, in particular, we have these three sub-hypotheses. Uh, in context with clearer responsibility structure, satisfaction with government, so the, the, um, the possibility to, to be the um, a government supporter will be more vulnerable to negative individual perception of the economy and individual, um, elect, uh, indiv individual electoral uh, perception of electoral fairness. So uh, the second uh, relates to uh, party system fragmentation. And we say that in, high, um, in highly fragmented party system, um, we have um, a problem to identify responsible uh, governments making less um, and it makes less detectable governments negligence so uh, the, th the third one relates with um, relates to free, uh, free media so the system of the mass media so free media's watchdog function attracts citizens attention on bad economic situation and so also or electoral malpractice because of this function uh, uh, of watchdog that tend to emphasize negative information about economy in particular, in part, uh, particularly, uh, influences so negatively uh, their support for the government. The second hypothesis, for us the main hypothesis, is, is that especially in Central and Eastern European democracies, the perceived quality of election uh, affects posi pos positively the degree to which voters hold governments accountable. So there will be a positive uh, correlation between satisfaction with, gov with government um, performance and um, perception, the perception of electoral integrity. So uh, data and methods. We, um, we use individual and country uh, level data. We use the European Social Survey, the sixth wave, because it's <laughs> the only way of including all, our, all the questions we needed to to write this, this research. Um, we focus on these eight available uh, Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, there should be 11, but we had, we had, we, they were not included. Croatia, uh, Latvia, and Romania were not included in, the, in this survey. So uh, we have one dependent variable, which is a measure of satisfaction with government performance. It is not the, the, the traditional measure for um, um, national voting tension that is usually employed in this, in this kind of study, but because we have not in this, the, that, that variable, that, that question in, uh, in, in the survey. So we use this, but there is a, uh, a, there is a growing literature about the, the possibility to use this, this, this variable as, as a measure of accountability. There's a recent, re recent book by Morganson that I use, that I read, found recently that uh, that's something about this. So the, the question is now thinking about the, the country government, how satisfied are you with the, the way <coughs> it is doing its job, responsive are a scale that runs from 10 to, from zero to 10. No? And so this is the distribution. Given this distribution, I use the, um, so I have multi-level, multi uh, uh, linear uh, regression model. 
So uh, we have two key independent variables at the individual level. One is um, individual evaluation measures individual evaluations of national economic situation and runs from 0 to 10, also in this case. It is a classic traditional question about uh, individual perception. The second one is uh, a, a measure that I built through um, confirmatory factor analysis. I took these three items that were quite highly correlated um, and so I, I built this, this index that runs from 1 to 10 and could be useful um, to measure uh, individual perception of electoral fairness in these countries. Uh, at the, the country level, we have these, these, these variables. One is an index uh, that I built using these three uh, items. One is parliamentary support for the, gov for the government. Zero if we have a minority government. One if we have a majority government. The uh, diversion of power, it w uh, zero if we have a coalition government, and one if we have a, um, a one, one party government. And government stability depends, of course, on the stability the years in, uh, in office of, this, of, of the, the, the government, incumbent government at the moment of when the, 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 the questioner was administered. So uh, the fragmentation of the party system, uh, we measure fragmentation of party system through the effective number of parties, traditional measure developed by Laxo and Tagepera. Um, finally, we have a measure of, uh, for uh, media freedom. We use the, the Reporters Without Borders Index, which runs from zero to 1,000, uh, well, 100. Um, we reversed the the index, so a lower um, a lower value means uh, less freedom of the press. The higher means um, higher freedom of the press, of course. And this is built on these six six items. So uh, last last slide about this is uh, um, about the methodology. But we we build this, we run this. We run these six hierarchical models, linear models with restricted ma maximum likelihood. So uh, the results that you can find in the end out uh, that I uh, that I sent you is that in, uh, in model one, two, and three, we test the direct effect of we we look we look at the effect of retrospective economic evaluations on our dependent variable plus the effect, the interaction be uh, uh, between our systemic, um, systemic variables with um, and retrospective economic evaluation. We conclude that people with more positive opinions of the economy are more likely to support the incumbent government. So this confirms the, the traditional the assumptions of the, the economic voting theory. Uh, the main effects of the systemic variables are rather significant, not so much it is between 90% and 95% and I don't remember now. Yeah, yeah 90 and 95%, but you can find there. Uh, so, um, okay, I got it. <laughs> so, um, there is an effect, but we, we want to go beyond. And, and this, what, what we are interested in is in, the, in models four, five, and six where we present evidence about the moderating effect of the same systemic variables on voters' perception of electoral fairness and, of course, their impact on the, our dependent variable. So people with more positive opinions about the quality of electoral procedures are more likely to be government supporters. So we have found that highly st um, statistical significance about this. The main effects of the systemic variables are in the expected direction so we have a negative, a negative um, coefficient for government clarity, positive for uh, the effective number of parties, and negative for press freedom, uh, press freedom index, but are not so much significant. In this case, instead, interactions are highly statistically significant. For this reason, I put the graphs. So this is the predicted marginal effects of government clarity, blah, blah, blah with government for different levels of individual perception of electoral fairness, we can, we can see 
that in this case, because I, I, I didn't I didn't put the the graphs for uh, the satisfaction with the economy because they are not significant. The, the effect is almost the same. So in this case, there is. Uh, a, a, a significant difference, more or less, because we have, in this case, we have the, uh, the line that represents the um, the relation between government clarity and satisfaction with government will be I uh, will be stronger in cases of where, where in context in which perception of electoral fairness uh, fairness is lower, so it's the minimum value one. In uh, in the second case, uh, we'll have. Um, positive relation, and it will be stronger in cases of, in context with uh, lower perception of, le of electoral fairness. So, uh, <coughs> uh, wha what we can say about this is that, so, as as in the case of mm, satisfaction with with economy, of course, in um, in context in which we have an higher number of parties, so an, a higher number of uh, available alternatives, it will be more difficult uh, for voters to assign responsibility to, to the government for electoral malpractices or, in case of economy, for a bad economic performance. So it is, uh, it is, it is, it is good for us. Uh, and in, the la in the last graph, we have um, the relation between press freedom and satisfaction with government. So in this case, there is a difference. In this case, um, in context with higher perception of electoral fairness, the relation, the, the effect, the watchdog effect of press freedom will be uh, stronger in, uh, on um, satisfaction with government because of the, the um, the uh, media's role, watchdog, and or um, how can I say? Uh, because they um, they they offer um, they they give room to political forces to debate, so to present their platforms and so on. So increasing electoral competition, let's say, and the quality of it offers. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, in Central and Eastern European countries, economy is more is important, but is not enough, because we find that we found that perception of electoral fairness um, is highly statistical significant and important. So systemic variables have a, a limited in, uh, direct impact, but consider interaction, in particular, in par uh, particular with perception of electoral fairness. So findings suggest to con to conduct further research about the electoral accountability, including also electoral integrity. Of course, there are limitations in perspective in my, in my paper. For, for example, the dependent variable I told you, uh, I, I couldn't use the, the, traditional, the traditional variable, but it, I think it will work. But I, mean, I, mean, I hope that you can help me. And the second is that of course, the, our measure of perceived electoral integrity uh, probably deserves improvement. Improvement, for example, now in the world that is hard, we have a good battery of questions about this this topic. So it could be easier to <coughs> to build to build an or use them separately. It depends. Uh, so perspectives enlarging the scope of to the European Union and beyond taking a, a larger sample, and of course, including also the, the relevance of the media that usually is not included in um, studies on electoral accountability, economic voting, they are not taking into taken into consideration, so it would be useful to include them. So this is my best slide. <laughs> <laughs> and thank so you. thank you very much. introduction and thank you for coming it's clearly a slightly leaner audience <laughs> now that Pippa has gone back to the States um, so thank you I'm looking forward to the discussion um, jumping right in this is basically derived from one of the empirical chapters of the dissertation and here I'm looking at as Alex said the drivers of news attention to domestic monitoring groups and I'm arguing that 
uh, despite some of the findings that we have in the literature, it's really a very skewed distribution and only the most resourceful and experienced groups manage to get any attention in the wider media at all. Um, this is basically important and interesting because we know the trend that not only elections have proliferated since the 70s or even earlier, but so has also the monitoring of elections. So I would say since the late 1980s, not only international organizations, but also domestic NGOs, social movements and interest groups have started to place scrutiny on the electoral process, as you can see here in the red line at the bottom. So this is an increasing phenomenon. And it's also uh, a phenomenon that attracts a lot of money from international assistance providers and donors. So from this practical perspective, it is quite interesting to see what influence these observer groups actually have. But more from a theoretical perspective, it is also interesting to see because we don't know a whole lot about the impacts um, of monitors on electoral integrity. We know a little bit. Um, from cross-nationally comparative literature and from field experiments at the micro level. And both of these literatures basically assume that information provided by monitors alters the cost-benefit calculations of those who may want to per um, perpetrate electoral manipulation. So as Susan Haidt and um, Nikolai Marinov show, if there are international monitors present in an election and they produce reports, there is a higher chance of uh, post-election protest and contestation if there were malpractices. And this is the signal that then would deter autocrats from actually manipulating the election. So this is sort of the um, rational choice argument that is behind most of the literature. But we don't know anything about whether this information that groups um, produce in reports actually reaches a wider audience at all. This is simply assumed, and it's more or less a black box so far. There's also a little bit about longer term effects of observers that has to do with building social capital and um, bridging social capital in particular. Um, but also here, the mechanisms are not very well specified, and that's why I hope to make a tiny um, theoretical contribution and innovation here to this literature by bringing in the agenda setting literature from public policy and also from political communication. And as Alex has pointed out, this is a pretty um, established agenda setting model of how issues reach certain agendas and at the very end the policy agenda where possibly issues that have to do in my case with electoral integrity may get formulated into actual policy. So I simply take this model and apply it to my issue at hand, which has to do with whether domestic observers, as one of the many actors who try to influence agendas, whether they are able to get the issue of electoral malpractice onto the wider media agenda, public agenda, and policy agendas. If that is the case, and of course there are many mediating influences here, then in the end we might actually expect that deterrence effect that Susan Haidt and Marinov are talking about. Or we may expect legal reform, reform of procedures of um, electoral processes. However, I cannot feasibly show um, that whole or get empirically um, test this whole process. So what I'm really zooming in is um, that first step. Can domestic observers, as outside actors to the political system who don't have that inside access that the gun lobby may have or that natural um, resource interest groups may have, can they influence the policy agenda? Well, if they want to do so, they have to go through the media. They have to actually create an audience for the issues that they campaign about. So um, election fraud, um, malapportionment, uh, gerrymandering and such issues need to get onto the media agenda. In order to do so, and here we come to the paper that I'm working on, um, they have to compete with many other issues and with many other groups um, about the scarce resource news attention. Because all of these issues vie for the limited space um, on a front page of a newspaper or the limited airtime in TV, um, some of them are selected and others are not. And this idea of the scarcity of news attention is really what motivates this research. So why are some groups able to capture 
the attention of news media, and why are others not able to do so? Here are some examples of what I'm measuring as the dependent variable in this study. News attention is essentially uh, at the very minimum level that a group is being mentioned by name in some, in my case, actually I study newspaper, print media. So that does not really look at how the group is framed, whether they are uh, quoted verbatim, how their issue is framed. It's just the very, very minimum precondition to get anything uh, onto the agenda, and that is being named. So here I have underlined, um, in, in a Nigerian uh, piece on the left, I have underlined uh, two NGOs in Nigeria. Here is a piece from Mal Malaysia, here one from the Philippines. This is what I'm mentioning, so uh, I'm measuring, sorry. So my unit of analysis is essentially uh, newspaper articles mentioning one of the about 700 domestic observer groups that I have in my data set. And here you see the um, distribution of that dependent variable. So that is quite devastating for those who say domestic observers make elections better because, as you can see in this uh, graph, it is a power law, um, as we would call it, meaning that more than uh, almost two-thirds of all the groups get zero news attention. They are not mentioned in any single newspaper article and the way I've measured it is coding the number of articles mentioning the groups in that country uh, in a period of two months before to two months after the last election in that country. So the big bar at the very left is all those groups that get either zero or only one article of mentions. At the same time you can see that there are some groups who get a lot of mentions in the news here at the right end of the spectrum. And I have standardized here the dependent variable by dividing um, the number of articles mentioning the group by the total number of articles published. Because obviously in India, there are more newspaper articles published than in Burkina Faso. So this is a very skewed and overdispersed dependent variable, which has implications for the models I can use. But still, this just reemphasizes the, the huge question, why do some groups capture news attention and others don't? So why do some press conferences look like this in Mozambique and others look like this um, from Citizen Election Watch in Uganda, uh, where the media apparently don't take that much note? Again, drawing on political communication literature, I just borrow a pretty standard onion model or hierarchical influences model of what affects the news media agenda. And so on the outside um, of that onion, you would have um, on the right real-world occurrences um, or actual problems that happen. So when Fukushima happened, everybody was talking about nuclear energy and whether we should continue with it. So I would expect um, that the real-world extent of mal electoral malpractices has something to do with news coverage of these groups. Then at the same time, uh, we also know that institutions such as press freedom quite significantly influence the gatekeeping role of the media. So where there is censorship and the government has a tight hold through ownership of the media on what they report, we would expect less news attention to groups that try to draw attention to electoral malpractice. So this is at the, the inner level of this onion. Um, but where I really want to put my money and what I want to bring in from what we know of through interest group studies is that not all groups are created equal. So when you look at groups as news sources, they have very different capabilities of producing news, uh, worthy material. Oscar Gandhi called this the production of information subsidies. So um, ready-made bits of information that journalists like to just copy and paste into their articles, um, providing uh, press conferences, press briefings, possibly interactive materials on the website and other types of information subsidies. And what we know from interest group studies is that professionalization of the groups, the way, the degree to which they're institutionalized, their, their amount of resources that they have, sheer money, staff, etc., and their experience and standing as a um, well-regarded actor is really what makes them more able to give these information subsidies. So this is where um, I basically want to place my model. Is it real-world occurrences? Is it um, institutions of press freedom? Or is it group characteristics? 
Therefore, I use independent variables that you might have suspected. The issue of tension is just simply the um, perceptions of electoral integrity index. Um, I use the press freedom index to sort of monitor the role of institutions um, and the media system. Um, and I use an organizational survey of about 300 domestic monitoring groups that I have conducted to measure their organizational characteristics. So far, I have about 120 responses to this survey, but this work is still ongoing, so I hope to increase my statistical leverage that I have there. In particular, I have three variables um, that I have constructed, and I'm very happy to go into detail in the discussion, um, and they sort of monitor the resources of the organization that I have built from three survey items. And I just show you the um, sort of the distribution of these variables. I monitor the degree of professionalization that is constructed from five different survey questions. And then finally, their experience, which is simply the age and how many um, elections they have monitored in the country. Coming to the modeling part. Because the dependent variable is so skewed and has so many zeros, I have to use a zero inflated negative binomial regression modeling, which took me a while to even come across that something like this exists. Uh, and I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm highly confident yet in knowing how um, this sort of modeling works, but um, I have used it in a previous chapter, so I'm building my expertise in this. And I'm just essentially, using a model that has two separate processes. One process called the zero component, which determines whether or not there is any mention of the group at all. So this binary process at the bottom drives the zeros in the dependent variable. And then the upper part, the so-called count component, drives that if there is any mention of the group, how many mentions are there? So, so almost two separate models built in one. So the good news um, for me is that in these four models in which I include in stepwise fashion the different, uh, so my variables of interest first and then the possible other explanations, the good news is that organizational resources and experience comes out as a significant determinant of news attention in the way that I measure it. So you see um, the top row and the third row, it's significant across all models. However, professionalization is not. It is significant in the first model, but it goes in the opposite direction. Um, and then it drops out if you actually control for the other factors, meaning if I compare like with like um, country or groups in countries with high press freedom with groups in countries with high press freedom, then that variable just drops out. And I hope to discuss about uh, why this could be the case and maybe going at it in a more theoretical fashion. Um, you, we can also see that press freedom and the level of democracy measured by combined polity four um, is significant. That means institutions shape the ability of groups to capture news attention. What's interesting is that the PI index is not significant. So the real or objective level of electoral malpractice seems not to drive news attention to the domestic observer groups, which in itself is quite interesting and I want to investigate more to sort of make it a little bit more um, um, visual I have sort of calculated marginal effects to predict the number of articles mentioning any given domestic observer groups and a uh, group and I have uh, here taken the variables that are significant in model four um, and that is here on the right, the group resources. I focus on that um, in this visualization. So I have on the one hand taken the highest quartile of groups, or sorry, the groups with the highest quartile of resources and the lowest one to sort of show how the resources really shape their, their predicted ability to grab news attention. And then I vary the institutional setting, freedom of the press or the combined uh, polity score. So what we see here is that in very repressive circumstances, at the left of these two graphs, no matter how well equipped and well resourced a group is, they are not likely to actually get a lot of news attention because either there is censorship or there is strong repression of civil society activities, etc. But when the setting 
gets a little bit freer in terms of press freedom or democracy, then the resources really start to matter. So then it really matters um, how much money, how much staff you may have dedicated to press work um, and liaisons with, uh, with journalists, etc. So clearly, to conclude, the organizational resources and experience do facilitate attention getting. And they do it in a very uh, differential way. So just as some scholars of interest group have shown, there is such a skewed distribution of news attention that we should probably not expect very high effects of observers in the big picture. But we may expect some effects of those very well resourced and very experienced groups that do get news attention. At the same time, institutions are important. Press freedom and democracy provide the um, sort of the, the ground on which all of this can work in the first place. But the real extent of electoral, electoral malpractice does interestingly not drive news attention. So I'm, I'm hoping for um, input on two things in particular, but I'm very happy to discuss it all. So basically, I really need to establish equivalence of my news attention measure, measure. So can I actually say that the number of articles in one country is equivalent to the number of articles in another country? And I am very, um, I'm hoping for you know articles or authors who have worked in that direction. And second, the zero inflated negative binomial model currently does not take into account the nested structure. Because I have country um, influences and I have group influences and I don't have that in the model yet. So any advice in that regard would be highly appreciated and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.